Isn't it great to be out? Just talk among yourselves. I'm trying to find something here. Right, I'm wired up. I've got all my gear here. Good morning. It's great to be let out, and what can I say, welcome back. We've been waiting for this moment maybe for four and a half months, coming close. What can I say, it's been, it's like being let out of jail. I think it was about three or four weeks into the, the lockdown, I, I was allowed to go to the, the doctors in St. Field to get a prescription. It was like Christmas morning for me. I drove out about 30 miles an hour, and I took the long way home. It was like... Daddy Christmas had arrived. But you know what? We've been let out of jail, but it's like we have to, what we're doing here this morning, it's like having a ball and chain around your ankle. There's certain things that we are not allowed to do. We have to remember to keep social distancing. If you sneeze, catch it, bend it and kill it. We're reminded that we need, still need to wash our hands. Our hands are sanitized during the way in. And here's the other thing in my, my speak. No kissing, no hugging. We're not allowed to sing. And we're not allowed to do the hokey cokey either until things get better. Some people are asking there about the offering. We're not going to have the offering the way we usually do it, but there will be four plates. The offering plates will be on the table on the way out. And if you have brought an offering with you, there will be an opportunity to put it in the offering plates. Uh, there's something I've wrote down. Oh, yes. There's UCB reading notes. If anyone uses them, they will be on the table on the way out if you want to collect them. So, I'd like to inject a bit of scripture into your mind this morning. Now, I'm going to be honest. What I'm going to be speaking about this morning will either confuse you or challenge you. Or if you think I'm talking a load of nonsense, come up and say it at the end. At the end. Alan, where do, you, where do you read that? Where do you get that from? But I want you to inject this verse. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And that, just hold that thought as we go into our service. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, throughout this period of lockdown, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you have never left us, you never will, and you will not forsake us. But Lord, maybe you have drawn us closer to yourself. Made, made us, you make us realize that those things that we get uptight about or upset about don't really matter. Lord, you, you are with us here this morning, and we thank you for the, the family of believers, this fellowship here in Trinity for the love, for the warmth, for our humanity to each other. Lord, we thank you for everything that you provide for us. Things that we took for granted have more relevance or importance to us here this morning. We thank you for our family, how close we have got to each one of them. But Father, we thank you for your Son, we thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. And we thank you for the gift of eternal life. And Lord, even now, you provide a way out for some of our wrongdoing. For the things that we say or do or think about, you have made provision for that as well. And so, Lord, we come to your, your presence right now. We would confess these things to you and ask for your forgiveness.
Lord, you know us inside out. Draw us close to you here this morning. Let us leave this place knowing that we have met with the risen Lord. And let us go out singing in our hearts, full of joy and praise for you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. He taught us as a family to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're not allowed to sing, so I think it's up to the, the ministers and the preachers, whoever is standing here from Sunday to Sunday, for us to be creative. So we're not allowed to sing, but we can talk about some of the songs that we do sing. And uh, I wonder if you, if you know this song here, It Is Well With My Soul. Would we all know that? Just in case you don't, I'm going to play it here just for maybe two minutes. When peace like a river... No singing or we'll have to throw you out. That's just, that's the rules. When peace like a river attended my way When sorrows like sea I start talking, <clears throat> you'll probably think to yourself, big man, keep quiet, switch your music back on. Some of the, the famous songs, the hymns that we know, the, the stories about how they were written is amazing. And this one in particular, and I'm going to put my glasses on here so to get his name right. The guy who wrote this hymn, his name was Horatio Spafford. He was a layman in the Presbyterian Church in America. And he had a successful legal practice, but he was also a devout Christian. So if I throw in a couple of names, he rubs shoulders with the likes of D.L. Moody and a couple of other famous evangelists. But Horatio Spafford lost his fortune in the Great Fire in Chicago in 1871. He lost everything overnight. It was burnt to the ground. And then a short time after that, he lost his son. His son died. But the worst was yet to happen. Horatio Stafford, his wife and four daughters, were wanting him to go over to England where D.L. Moody was preaching. And they had planned to go on this ship to sail over to England to follow this gospel campaign of D.L. Moody. But something happened at the last moment, and Horatio Spafford could not go with his wife and his four children. And so they got on the boat, and near England, the ship that they were on collided with another ship. And the ship that they, Horatio's wife and four children were on sunk. A short time later, Horatio Spafford got a telegram from his wife 
saying, Saved alone, his four daughters went down with the ship. So Spafford, Horatio Spafford got on a ship and sailed over to England to meet his wife. And at the captain of the ship reminded him where the accident, this tragedy happened. And it was there that this man got the words of this hymn. It is well with my soul, even though I have lost my whole family. It is well with my soul. There's loads of hymns like that that we know we're quite famous, we have grown up with. They have been penned out of a tragedy. And yet, in amongst all that tragedy, we get hymns like this. It is well with my soul, even if the world falls down round among us. It is well with my soul. What a cheery note to start us off with. So hopefully this might be a wee comeback. I'm not going to ask any children to come up to the front, but there's still that wee moment. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever heard the story of the hungry caterpillar? You have? Well, it starts off once upon a time, and I have to tell you, if someone starts a story off once upon a time, it's actually a good story. So here goes. Once upon a time, in the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. See the wee dot just to the left-hand side? Of, that's the wee egg. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up, and out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. You're sitting on the edge of your seat here, I can sense it. He started to look for some food. And he said to himself, boy, I'm hungry. I could eat a crocodile. So on Monday, he ate through one apple. And after that, he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate through two pears. And he was still hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries. But he was still hungry. On Friday, he ate through five oranges. Wouldn't you love to keep, just, you could afford to keep his foot out, never mind keep him. But he was still hungry. On Saturday, he ate through a piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, a pickle, one slice of cheese. You think this boy needs wormed instead of more food. One slice of salami, a lollipop, a sausage, Cupcake, one piece of cherry pie. And that night he had a stomach ache, not a bit of wonder. And the very hungry caterpillar then ate a bit of a green leaf and he started to feel better. Now, the very hungry caterpillar was no longer very wee, as we would say in Northern Ireland. He was a big he was a big caterpillar. And he built a small house called a cocoon. And he stayed inside this cocoon for more than two weeks. And then he nibbled a small hole and he came out into the world. And he came out as a butterfly. This reminds me, I'm going to be talking about this later, but Nicodemus where Jesus said to him, you must be born again. It's the difference between the caterpillar and the butterfly. I'm going to ask Lynn to come forward and with our scripture reading. The reading is from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. Jesus teaches Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, 
no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it was going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not sta believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lynn. I wonder if you've ever heard a minister or a local preacher or anyone else for that fact make the following statement from this pulpit. You must be born again. John chapter 3 verse 7. I would be very surprised if someone from Northern Ireland told me that they had never heard those words in a church. You must be born again. Sometimes, actually, if you drive around the country, you see people put those words, nail them to a tree on a wee sign. And Jesus said those exact words to a man called Nicodemus. What can I tell you about Nicodemus? He was a member of the Jewish ruling council, also known as the Sanhedrin. That was a posh name. And the Sanhedrin was really the Jewish court system that consisted of 71 rabbis, a bit like our Stormont, where they make the rules and regulations. Any laws or decrees issued by the Sanhedrin were binding on all of the Jewish nation. This man, Nicodemus, was a teacher of the law. And only the high priest, Caiaphas, Caiaphas, gained more recognition in Jerusalem than this man, Nicodemus. So he was one of the big cheeses in Jerusalem. And despite all his learning, his position in life, and all his privileges, he knew about God in his head but he didn't know God in his heart. And he came to Jesus at night so that no one could challenge him about meeting this 
This man who professed to be the Son of God, this man who professed to be the Messiah, he came to Jesus at night because he didn't want to be challenged or found out. And as we listen and engage with Nicodemus and his conversation with Jesus, the darkness that was in his soul becomes obvious. And he declares that Jesus is a teacher who has come from God. And he said that no one could do the things that he was doing if God was not with him. And he came to Jesus at night because he was searching as well. And he wanted to talk to Jesus about finding out more. And Jesus has that conversation with him. And he tells him this, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And then he goes to talk about, how can you be born again? How can someone who's born old be born again? That's impossible. And this is where the darkness of his soul was. Nicodemus was talking about a natural birth, where Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth. You should not be surprised at me saying this, Jesus said. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Jesus goes on to say to him that no one can be born into the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. And whenever you read that word water in John chapter 3, it's the same as reading the word seed in Matthew chapter 13. And for those of us here that are believers that have put our faith in God, we can, I could probably get loads of people to come up and talk about how they were convicted of their sin and how they gave their life to Christ, how they were born again. But Nicodemus heard about the miraculous things that Jesus was doing, and that's what got his attention. He doesn't know the man who is performing those miraculous signs or why he's doing it. But he does hear the message, you must be born again. And here's my question here this morning. We all, we, most of us know these words, you must be born again. And here's a wee question, why? Why do we need to be born again? To understand that question, you need to understand this wee passage of Scripture here. And it's Paul is the writer of the book of Thessalonians, and he comes near enough to the end of the chapter, and he says, May the God, may God make you holy through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept free from blame. May you be without blame from now until our Lord Jesus Christ comes. And you're probably saying to yourself, well, that makes it very clear. That makes no sense at all. To understand that, we need to go back to the beginning in the book of Genesis, to the beginning of creation, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here's a wee rib tickler here for you. If you were to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before God created the heavens and the earth, God knew each and every one of us. That's what it says in Ephesians 1, chapter 4. Some of us think through Sunday school stories, even our Christmas story, we, we are very familiar with the Christmas story, we're very familiar with the creation story. And you have it in your head, God created man on day six. Where God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Genesis 1, verse 26. Verse 27, it says this. So God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them male 
and female. And you have to ask yourself, what is God like? John 4 verse 24 says this, God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and truth. When God created mankind on day six, God created the human spirit. Hold that thought. Your spirit consists of three parts. We have communion or fellowship with God. This allows us to commune or connect with God. We have a conscience, which, is a, which allows us to discern what is right and wrong, or moral compass, if you like. And we have this intuition. This allows us to have a direct sense of knowledge from God, regardless of your intellect, regardless of your, the environment that you're in. I think I've maybe shared this story before. Have you ever had a wee moment? You're driving a car, you're walking down the street, and you get this wee notion, phone so-and-so. Thought comes out of nowhere. And you make the phone call, and the person at the other end of the phone goes, how did you know to phone me? I, something really happened. And they, we have this intuition from God. It's a passage in John that says, my sheep hear my voice. That's God speaks to us every day in more ways than we can even imagine. So that's the spirit. We have a spirit, and your spirit has communion or fellowship, conscience and intuition. And this is where the baffling bit goes. We have in our minds that God created mankind on day six. And then you go over the, into the next, next chapter, chapter two, verse seven. And it says, the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground. It's not a different story. It's just a continuation of the one story. And our body has three parts as well. This is quite easy. We have flesh, we have blood inside our body, and we have bones which gives us our structure. And this is the interesting bit if you read that in Genesis chapter 2. Then the Holy Spirit breathed into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living being. That word breathed is a Hebrew word, ruach, the ruach of God, gave life to the man. Whenever you read that passage at the very beginning of Genesis, in the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the ruach of God, the breath, the Holy Spirit, hovered above the waters. So we have, a, we have a spirit, we have a body, and we have a soul. And your soul is three parts as well. We have a mind. That's our thoughts. We have a, a will. That's a bit of us that's stiff-necked and uh, certainly not doing that. Sorry. And we have emotions. Love, hate, joy, laughter, sadness. That, that makes up of our soul. And whenever you listen to the words of that song, it is well with my soul. Even though that man had the most devastating news that he lost his family, he said, it is well with my mind, my will, and my emotions. When God created man, he looked back at it and said, it's very good. That's the best I could do with Adam. He created mankind, and we have three parts. It consists of a, a spirit, a soul, and a body. And Paul says there's a bit of a battle going on here because the body wants to do this, and the spirit wants to do that. And there's a constant battle between the spirit and the body. And the, the bit in the middle is the soul. That it's a constant battle. 
There's a wee bit where he says, do you know, that I want, there's things I don't want to do, and I end up doing them. And there's things that I do want to do, and I don't do them. And that's the battle that's happening between the body and the soul. And then God says to Adam, he gives him this quite clear and concise command. He says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And just so he knew what he was talking about, he was talking about that tree there. Do not eat from that tree. I'm not saying that's the actual tree, but that's... God was saying, see that tree in the middle of the garden? Do not eat it, because if you do, you will certainly die. You can't get much clearer than that. Eat from that tree and you will certainly die. And then the story goes on. It's not right that man should be alone. He needs a, he needs a mate. He needs a helper. And he put, God put Adam to sleep, took a rib from his side, and created Eve. And this is where this guy creeps into the story. The serpent, the devil. And he's really crafty. And I want to say this about the, the devil knows Scripture. He knows Scripture probably far more than what we, we do because he twists it. And he says to Eve, did God really say, munch, 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 if you ate from that tree, munch, munch, that you would certainly die? That tree there, did God really say not to eat? I'm just adding a wee bit of ad lib here. That tree, munch, 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 that you would certainly die. No, your eyes will be opened whenever you eat from this tree. So they did. And they suddenly discovered that they were naked. They were full of shame and guilt and remorse. And this is where it gets really confusing. You ask yourself, eat from the tree and you will certainly die. That's what the message was. That's what... That's what the clear command was. Eat from that tree and you will certainly die. And if you were to read on in Genesis, it says, Adam lived to be 930 years old and then he died. And in our speak, I would say that man lived a full life. And you're going, we're made up of three parts. We have a spirit, a soul, and a body. And I'm confused. What, what part of him died? The part of Adam and Eve that died, the top two squares, top right, and top left, the part to have fellowship with God died, the part, the ability to commune directly with God was cut. The sin that Adam and Eve committed in that garden separated them from the presence of God. Sin broke that relationship that allowed Adam and Eve to hear the words of God come directly to them. And what happened next? They were put out of the, the Garden of Eden. Back on track. This is why it's important whenever you hear the words of Jesus to Nicodemus or even to yourself, you must be born again. Jesus came to this earth to right a wrong. Jesus suffered and died on that cross to make us right with God. And all we have to do is believe in our heart that he died on the cross for our sins and that God raised him from the dead. That's what it's all about. It's a bit like transforming from that caterpillar into a butterfly. The old has gone, the new is here. And that's what we look like. We're restored to the way God created us. We can have direct fellowship with God. 
we can have intuition that God is speaking to us through his written word or his spoken word. And the bit that I didn't speak about there, the con- conscience, I used to hear people say, what about those people throughout the world that have never, say Africa, those tribes in Africa that have never heard the gospel preached to them, or maybe someone in Ireland here, have never heard the gospel before in their life, and they die. If they've never heard the gospel preached to them or even mentioned, where do they stand before God? They'll be measured by their moral compass. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. You'll be judged by your moral compass if you've never heard the gospel before. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You're born physically, you're born of the flesh, but you must be born again spiritually. The bit that I just talked about, your spirit, your soul, and your body, that's that's the knowledgeable bit. But here's the more important, the, the heart knowledge of why Jesus died on that cross. Jesus, God allowed Jesus to come to this earth to die on a cross for our sins because he loves us. He loves each and every one of us. And if you were the only person on this earth, Jesus would have come and died for you alone. That passage of Scripture, we've probably grown up with this. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the gift, that's the offer that God is making to us. Nicodemus, we all think in John chapter 3, he's a bad guy. The next time Nicodemus is mentioned in the scriptures is in John chapter 7. Jesus is arrested in the garden of Gethsemane. And Nicodemus stands up as a teacher of the law, as a member of the Sanhedrin. Guys, what's this? Are we condemning people before we give them a trial? He speaks up on behalf of Jesus. And the next time that Nicodemus is mentioned is in John chapter 19. Jesus has been crucified, he's dead, and he's mentioned along with Joseph of Arimathea. He brings spices to anoint the body of Jesus according to the Jewish custom. I would say Nicodemus not only had head knowledge about God, but John chapter 19 tells me that he had heart knowledge as well. Now, this wee boy over here has been doing our heads in for this past four and a half months. All the rules and regulations that we have to do, even being here tomorrow, this morning, we are complying with the information that we have been given, and rightly so, because this will affect our physical body. But there's this bio that's been flying around the world for years and years and years. This can have an impact on our physical or spiritual body. You must be born again. I can't make you a Christian. You don't waken up one day and go, oh, I think I'll become a Christian today. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of your sin. It's not me. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of your sin, that you're not right with God, and challenges you and me. For me, I read the Bible in secret for about four months, and I come to the conclusion, it's either the biggest load of nonsense that was ever written, or it's absolutely true. And if it's absolutely true, what are you going to do about it, big man? And I gave my life to the Lord because I accepted that Jesus died for me on the cross. But some of the Christians are probably sitting here this morning. That doesn't apply to me. I'm in the kingdom. I'm I'm born again. I've got my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the challenge is, once you come into the kingdom, is to grow. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord didn't call us into the kingdom to stand still. I mentioned this on the twelfth day. He called us to go forth, to lack laha, to go forth in his grace and in his knowledge. And I have this wee image of the church. A ship is safe in a harbour, but that's not where it's meant to be. And God is calling us 
Guys, I know you have a wee comfort zone. You're quite happy with your, what you're doing. But will you follow me? Because I want to take you to a new place. I want to bless you. I want to bless the people around you where you live. I want to bless your community. If you would only trust me and follow me where I want to take you. Does anyone know what that is, by the way? You'd think I was up in a helicopter, took a wee photo. It's, no. That's Valletta in uh, Malta. A ship is safe when it's in the harbour, but that's not where it's meant to be. You must be born again. Let us pray. Lord, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your promise of eternal life and your grace still stands here today. But Lord, help us to trust you, to follow you, and you will amaze us. You will bless us, and you will bless the people around us. Lord, hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. At some stage, while we have this format of the service, at some stage I might come up and say to you, your hair is nice. So what I'm really going to say to you is, what has God been saying to us over this past four months? Has God said something to you individually, or has he done something amazing in your life or in your family that maybe you'd like to come up? Your probably knees are knocking here. Maybe some Sunday you'd come up and share your story with each other, just to encourage each other. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not going to put any pressure on someone or anyone, but if I do say your hair's nice, you know what's going to come afterwards. Can we share the benediction, the grace together? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Now, we were careful coming in. We have to be careful going out. Now, the offering plates will be on the table uh, where you saw Paula taking your name and details on the way in. There's one door where we're going out. You follow the blue, the blue circles with the feet. But Phil, could I ask you, maybe you could lead the charge out? If we go the 